Hi, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts, and this is my week of reading wrap up where I talk about the books that I read this week, what I'm currently reading, and then potentially could read next week based on my mood. So as predicted last week, I did not read as many books because I'm starting to do this immersion thing where I'm trying to listen, watch more television and movies in both French and Italian to, uh, to help immerse myself in the language, culture, and, and get better at listening and speaking. Uh, both of those languages. So uh, I have, my husband and I did an add-on channel to our Prime. I think it's called Megahertz Choice, M-H small z choice. Uh, and it's been phenomenal because it has all sorts of television programs from Europe. And so you can filter by language and it, it all pops up. And I would say the ch options and choices are really good. I've, I've been impressed with what they have available to, to watch. And they're subtitled, so you can read the subtitles, but listen in the original language. So we've been having a lot of fun with that. Uh, started with the George Simonon Mysteries. So George Simonon, just to let you know, yes, is an author. Uh, I read this this year and really loved it. This is Red Lights. Now this is set in New York uh, on a road trip. So this is kind of a, a not his normal type of work. It's usually set in France. And he's very well known for the McRae series, which is uh, an inspector. And I haven't read any of those yet. It's on my list. I, I keep saying I'm going to read it, but I keep holding off. Uh, but he, these books, these one-offs, I have another one here. Uh, this is Betty. And I just love that cover. Uh, his one-offs tend to be very uh, little noirish, I would say, uh, adult um, adults doing weird things, wrong things. Uh, you're kind of the darker impulses uh, type of writer. So when I saw that there's something called George Simon and Mysteries, I thought, oh well, let me tr start with that before going to Marais. The first one was fantastic, set in Paris, and it was winter, so everything's a little gray. And the setup is that a woman walks out in front of a car that she does not see coming, and she's killed. Her husband finds out, and that is the impetus that kind of shatters his impression of what their marriage really was. Uh, so and it's slow unravel uh, type of a thing. I think it was like an hour and a half uh, for the episode, if not a little longer, but really good, loved it. Loved just being immersed in Paris and hearing French and, and, and everything it was sublime. Then we started watching Il Giovane Montalbano, and this is uh, based on the character that was created by Andrea Camilleri. So Montalbano is a detective that is working out of Sicily and the first episode had him in the mountains and then he got transferred into the seaside. So you've got just gorgeous, gorgeous images and settings and it's, it's uh, interesting and funny, you know, mystery series, love it. So uh, hard to go wrong there. And then we also started watching Luna Park. This was on Netflix and it's set in the 60s in Rome and we've got uh, three families. It's got tarot readers and, uh, and a, carna a carnival, traveling carnival, and then we have a rich family and then a family of communist scholars. Uh, and uh, things are happening uh, among, among these, these different families. Uh, beautiful, beautiful costuming and I, I really Really like the the characters of that so that's going well one thing that was a horrible disappointment <laughs> oh I was so upset so as I'm kind of scrolling through I see Brunetti and Brunetti is from Donna Leon's series set in Venice uh, you know so it's a great series and I, I enjoy it very very much I just thought, oh my God, Venice, a, a great character. I, I want to watch it immediately. So I put it on and the vistas are just remarkable. The setting's fantastic. Uh, the characters, I, who the actors that they chose for, the, for Brunetti and his wife and his, and his two children were perfect spot on. But there's one big problem. Well, at least big for me. And that is, it's, it's in German. <laughs> which 
is not helping me. It's not helping me in my cause of trying to immerse myself in the language, especially because I'm watching it and I'm anticipating um, a phrase or I'm anticipating what he's going to say. And then it comes back to me in German. So I had to stop watching it and I was very disappointed. So I hope I hope someone makes uh, the Brunetti series in Italian so I can watch that. But that really did uh, lessen my time for reading. So I have a few fewer books to talk about. Let's talk about what I've completed this week. So the first thing I was doing a buddy read with Leo of A Little Book Life because we are uh, in anticipation of Leo receiving his copy of To Paradise. So I have this, this hefty tome here. The moment he gets it, we are a go. Uh, so I ran out and got the side copy the day that it that it launched. I will say I have a little trepidation. Um, I think I've mentioned before that I don't like to see reviews. I don't like uh, to be to have someone else's perspective uh, kind of shadowing my reading experience where I'm, I'm validating or or invalidating other ideas or or views or thoughts about a book. Now, of course, if it's a classic, you, you know, you really you don't really have a choice. You know, it's, it's in the lexicon of our of our. Uh, education system of our cultural systems right but something like this that's brand new I'm, I'm avoiding watching videos that are talking about it but I keep seeing some shade on Twitter which is making me a little nervous so uh, I'm, I'm Leo is not as is not like I am so he's he's reading everything and he's trying to get a sense of what people are saying uh, for me I'm holding I'm reserving judgment, but I am really, really curious about her fascination with power and suffering. So the book that we just finished is her first novel. This is her debut, The People in the Trees by Hanya Yanagahara. I don't think I mentioned her name when I showed this. Um, this was done in 2015 and ostensibly it's a story of a discredited scientist who was accused of sex crimes against young uh, against young people, uh, children, uh, and children that he had adopted. Uh, now, the this is based on a real case that actually happened, and our the the main person Norton, who's been accused of these things and actually convicted, we hear about him. We first we hear about him from a. Uh, unnamed narrator who's kind of like our entree into this person. This is a disciple, acolyte, a friend, uh, someone who's worked closely with Norton. And it's very, very clear that they, they refuse to deal in reality about what's happened or they are an apologist for Norton and what he's been accused of. And so we, we go in with that understanding and they kind of set set the scene for us. They have convinced Norton that he has to make his case known. He needs to be the one to talk about what's happened. He needs to, to state for the record uh, his defense. And so he he's convinced, Norton is convinced to write his memoirs. And then what we're reading in this book are the memoirs with footnotes from this kind of editor, uh, friend, acolyte, disciple, editor. Very reminiscent of Lolita in how it's set up, right? You very quickly, it's the full life up to the present day of Norton. And Norton is just an odious, odious character. Uh, narcissistic, cruel, uh, very obvious that he uh, has issues with power and issues with comp, comp, like competing with anyone in his in his um, circle. Uh, a lot of misogyny, a lot of racism, uh, just reflexive, like this is just who he is. Uh, so he's brought to, on this expedition. He has graduated and he's been working as a scientist in this lab. 
uh, you get the sense that nobody really likes this guy. And so he, it's very surprising when he gets chosen for this expedition uh, with this very famous anthropologist uh, talent. And Talent is someone who cares very deeply for this community, and he's, he's heard a rumor that there are a group of people living on this island that no one has seen before. And so the idea, this is still, I think this is set in the 50s, and so the idea that there are still un parts of the world where people haven't been discovered yet is very exciting. So they go into this jungle in Microasia, and what they find is, is startling. They find that there is a group of people who are not aging. Uh, they are physically seem young, uh, and not very, very young, but they don't, they've stopped growing in age. So they still have the ability, the physical strength and agility and ability to do things, but their minds have started to age and grow as if they're continuing on and so the deterioration, uh, the dementia, the inability to see, uh, those types of things that are more associated with your brain are occurring with these people. Things happen on that island and he ends up bringing children, uh, bringing children back with him and adopting them. Now I'm not going to say anymore because I definitely don't want to spoil anything here. Leo and I talked so deeply about this book. This is like a perfect book club buddy read type of experience because it is mm, confronting. It is provocative. Um, It, it, there's so many moral questions about colonialism, about the act of anthropology, about science, about destruction in the name of science, uh, about human, human independence and consent. Uh, it, it, there's this is there's so much going on here and so much like I said is very provocative incredibly confronting uh, and we just went real deep with it the writing especially on the island I can see this this village I can see these people I can see the jungle uh, she she is Hawaiian and you you get a sense that she deeply knows the the flora and fauna the experience of of living in kind of these this type of environment i was fascinated with her little stop in hawaii because it's one of he has to go to hawaii first and then on the way to this microasia island and the racism that he just casually exhibits is in is fitting with the character, but really hard to read, um, and really kind of jarring. Even though you know it's what time, what the time period is, and it fits, it's still one of those things that's very shocking. So Leo and I were talking about this. I can't say that this was an enjoyable read, but I, I thought a lot about it. I still think a lot about it. Uh, and I mo am most interested in the very last few chapters of this book because she really puts her thumb on the scale of what we're supposed to think. There's no ambiguity left in this book by the end of it, which uh, made me rethink Lolita. Uh, Lolita is a book that is filled with with uh, moral quandaries and it's filled with uh, some lightness and levity uh, which is very uncomfortable as you're reading it uh, because you're in the mind of a sexual predator and a pedophile. Um, this is, doesn't leave those openings. It really seals the seals the deal, you know exactly what happened, there's no questions. Does, and so I go back to one of my favorite essays by Brandon Taylor that my In Real Life Book Club uses all the time now. We, and I'll, I'll include a link to it below because I think it's that interesting. And it talks about the morality and immorality of literature. Not the subject matter. We're not talking about subject matter, we're talking about the way the story is framed. 
are you as a reader given the space to make your own judgments or are you diverted into a, a path that's, that's created for you to arrive at a conclusion? It's a fascinating uh, essay. I will link to it below. And again, it made me look at Lolita differently, which is a big deal because I, that book really jar, is incredibly jarring, incredibly upsetting to me. Um, yeah. So, th so this is why I read, to think deeply about not just what I read, but why, why did I read it? What was the author trying to say? And how do I feel about the construction, the writing, the, the people, the, the plot, the, all, of, all of it. So on that sense, well done, Hani Anagahara. But again, I'm very concerned, <laughs> apprehensive about To Paradise. We'll see. And do not spoil anything for me in the comments if you if you leave a if you leave a comment please so i finished that and then went to one of my digital arcs that i have as you may know i need to get through a backlog of digital advanced reader copies that have been granted to me from netgalley so when i saw this i i thought oh uh, you know i love a below the stairs type of story this is the maid by nita prose uh, new release, and I thought, okay, I you know love domestic stories, uh, of domestic work, uh, love the below the stairs, uh, you know, in more traditional older British literature. So curious to see an updated version of that. This book did not work for me at all. Uh, I'll just say that straight out. Uh, our main character is Molly, and this is all told from her perspective and she is neurodivergent and uh, loves her job, loves her grandmother who has recently passed away and uh, is ver a very linear thinker, socially awkward, uh, and doesn't pick up on the things that are happening around her, therefore is easily misled. So to me, this read like uh, a book that I read a while ago, which was The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. Uh, so it was a very simplistic, very lacking in a lot of nuance, very choppy, very wooden uh, type of, of reading experience for me. I would love to see a neurodivergent character with a little more nuance, um, with not everything so overt. Um, and so it just, it did, like I said, it just did not work for me. And then that, I, I tried to put that aside and say, okay, well, let me just keep going because this is an arc and I need to finish it. I would have just DNF'd it uh, at that stage. I kept going and the ending, I swear, I, there was like three different endings where I was like, okay, we're done now. And of course I'm reading it digitally, so I'm not paying attention to like how much more I have to read. But I was like, okay, well, there we go. We wrap it up. And then it just continued like, okay, well, here we go. Now here's the ending. And then it continued. And the last, uh, I just didn't buy it. I didn't like the ending. It was far, it just came out of left field for me and uh, it didn't, I just didn't buy it. So yeah, all over, this was just a pan for me, did not enjoy it at all, which is a shame. But now let's get into what I'm currently reading. Y'all, I have read more Proust, quite pleased with myself. I sat down and had a good old read yesterday and uh, doubled where I was before, so uh, yay me. <laughs> this is uh, In Search of Lost Time, Volume 4, Sodom and Gomorrah, and John Sturrock is the translator of this. We are back in the uh, salons and ballrooms of the elite and watching some of the pettiness happening among the the people who are trying to curry favor with the Gramantes and and the princesses and what's happening is that the Dreyfus affair as it's been discussed a little bit in some of the previous books are really coming to a head here and we have Swan being ostracized for his position 
whereas he's always been part of this community. He's always been uh, had entree. Uh, now, all of a sudden, his Jewishness is coming into question that he's more Jewish than he is one of them uh, because of his position on the Dreyfus affair. Uh, so curious, you know, that's a interesting piece of politics that's starting starting to take on more uh, uh, impact with this one. So I'm curious to see where that goes. Then I'm continuing with The Years uh, by Virginia Woolf. I'm reading this with Elizabeth of Bookish North and we had our first check in. I, I do really like this except for, uh, you know, it's coming, the casual racism. Um, she just throws out on one page a horrible uh, nickname that is being bandied about for a uh, nickname for a white person that is a the N, uh, shortened version of the n-word and then on the very next page uh, a reference to someone that they call the jew boy uh, that's a member of the, the college at Oxford, uh, speaking about him in very denigrating manner. And it just, oh, it just kills me because it just take, it just completely deflates any of the moral um, high ground that I want to give her for some of the things that I see as so progressive. And then this is just, it just deflates everything for me. But what I do find in here that is interesting is she's taking the almost the party scene uh, type of point of view from Mrs. Dalloway, which is one of my favorite scenes in Mrs. Dalloway. And she's applying it in different settings here. So we have different years. So we're going through a family, many characters, uh, maybe too many characters, and we have different settings where these characters are in uh, a tea in a in a Don's home uh, in their in their kitchen. Uh, and one of the characters is just flipping from judging to adoring this family to judging their their conditions to judging what they say to really loving the the handsome young young son that comes in and all of a sudden being enamored with them to a funeral scene. Uh, which is just done so well, and the the, the flipping of emotions and the, the the way that you process what's happening in the moment at the same time it's we, we hear what what's going on, and so that internal external, uh, just absolutely remarkable. Uh, so I'm going to continue on with this. This is going to be something that will be will take us a little while to get through because she's a dense writer. So, in, but in, you know, enjoying it were not for that racism. Then I also have another digital arc that I'm enjoying very much. This one is a surprise. This is by Maria Genza, and it's Portrait of an Unknown Lady. And this is uh, Argentinian, set in Buenos Aires, and it's translated by Thomas Bunstead. Our main character is... Uh, a woman who, as a young woman, has been introduced to the world of authentication of art, and uh, she has been taken under the wing of a very esteemed woman who seems to be doing some uh, untrue authentication, forgeries, basically. She's trafficking in forgeries, but no one knows. But she takes our, our main character under her wing. Uh, she passes away and give, it creates a space for our narrator to kind of step, does she step into her role or does she take the opportunity to uh, pivot and try something a little less illegal? Uh, so I'm really curious to see where this one goes. The writing is so interesting. There's a lot of invention and imagination uh, within the context of this art world uh, in Buenos Aires. So enjoying it tremendously. And then I just started an audiobook. This is The Sentence by Louise Erd Erdridge. And I, this one is a little quirky too. I wasn't sure if it was going to be something that I enjoyed, but I'd heard things about it that were really good. Uh, so we have a woman who has a very interesting past. Uh, she was kind of a hellraiser and spent time in prison for very ridiculous crime that she perpetrated. 
And she now ha has been reformed, as is later on in her life, and she works in a bookstore, and she loves literature, and she loves recommending books, and she's really, really good at it. Uh, one of their more interesting characters, um, interesting customers, passes away, and she believes is now haunting the bookstore. What I'm loving about this is the way that she's talking about uh, this white woman's encroachment into uh, indigenous American culture. Uh, so much of what, uh, what Louise Erdrich writes about is uh, Native American culture, indigenous culture, and uh, settings. And, and uh, some, of this, some of it is laughable, but it also is incredibly interesting points of view. I'm enjoying it so far, more, way more than I expected. So that's it for me for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll look forward to talking to you later. Bye.